here to tell you about my life as a revolutionary. But first, I need to tell you about Charlotte Binns. Charlotte is a social entrepreneur who lives in New York City. She co-founded a technology company, and last year she sold it. This is the public school where her son goes to school. It's located in Brooklyn, and this is the playground. And if you look up in the far corner beyond the sports yard, you will see a small play structure. Earlier this year, Charlotte discovered something called the participatory budget process. Have you heard of this? No, I hadn't heard of it either until she shared, shared it with me. The way that a participatory budget process works is each district in a city has a city council member who represents them. And that city council person can decide if they want to allocate a portion of their budget that year to be voted on by the people who live in that area and voted towards which capital improvement projects it should go towards. Charlotte heard this and she thought, oh, I wanna do something. I wanna do something with this schoolyard. So she went to people in the school, she went to the teachers, she went to other parents, she went to the kids, and she said, what do you think that we should do with this schoolyard? The playground in the school happened to be across from one of the major freeways in New York. And so when you're playing on the playground, what you see are lots and lots of cars driving by. And so Charlotte thought, well, what if we made this playground a greener space? What if we made it an educational space? What if we planted this huge garden wall hiding that freeway? What if we put a learning center, a learning garden, and a place where the kids could be outdoors to learn? What if we improved the basketball courts and the running track by putting lights there so that people could play there at nighttime? And this was the proposal that she and her collaborators put together. For participatory budgeting to work, you have to get people to vote for your project. So what Charlotte and her team did was they enrolled the students and they said, let's do this for you and let's do this together. So the kids hit the street. And the cool thing about participatory budgeting is you, there are two criteria to vote. You have to be 14 years old and you have to live in the area in that district. So they got the kids involved, which built community. They got kids of all ages involved. These girls were running a lemonade stand and they would only give you lemonade if you voted for their project. <laughs> there were about 14 competing projects and there were three winners. I love the, this kid in the corner here. You can see that he is ready to make a learning garden happen. <laughs> so this project ended up winning. It was the number one voted on project. They won $400,000 of the $1 million that was available. This was a massive success. Not only is it going to improve this area for the kids, but it also built community. Charlotte told me that there were neighbors who had been living next to each other for years, some even a decade. They would see each other all the time. They never said hello until they had something mutual to talk about and something to work on together. One of the best things that has come out of this project is that it engaged the young people. And as the principal of the school said, this is important because the young people are the people who will shape our society tomorrow. I'm here today for something really big. We have massive challenges on our planet right now. We are facing issues with overpopulation, pollution, poverty. We're facing climate change, or what it should actually be called increased occurrences of extreme weather. In the next five to 10 years, we're going to be experiencing more drought. I'm originally from California, which is in a four-year drought. I have never in my life seen the rivers and lakes as low as they are now. In the northwest of the United States, a huge portion of it is on fire. And the, the firefighting resources are so tapped that they are importing resources from Australia to fight fires in the United States. Not only this, we have super storms, we have stronger, harsher winters. We're facing an unprecedented rapid rate loss of species that we've never seen before during humans' existence on this planet. We're facing terrorism, facing war, facing something really scary, which is the automation of artificial intelligence, automized weaponization of it. And this is a big deal. 
My biggest passion is stabilizing climate change. And recently, I said, well, in order to do this, it's going to take a lot of people getting involved. It's going to take all of us getting involved to tackle this massive issue. And so I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I can create a framework that inspires people to participate and inspires them to get involved. And so that's what I've done. I created a framework that takes people from being what I call passive consumers of life, who are waiting for other people to create solutions for them, who are waiting for authorities, who are waiting for the state to take care of our problems. And it does two things. It inspires them to become powerful creators of solutions. The other thing that it does is it builds the human network or our social ecosystem. Now, why are these things important? These are important because what we're facing is so massive. I don't know if you realize this, but the survival of our species is at risk because we are so damaging our ecosystem. So anyone who is capable of helping must help. The second thing that it does through building the, the social ecosystem is the benefit of this is this is how we get our business done. This is how we get stuff done. It's through the people that we know and the relationships that we have. So where did, where did this come from? What is my experience with participatory culture? Does anyone know what this is? Yes, what is this? Burning Man. So for those of you who don't know, Burning Man, simply put, is an event that has been happening for 30 years. It just happened last week. I just came from there to come here and be with you. And what it is, is it's a temporary experiment in community. 70,000 people come from all over the world. I met these people while I was waiting in line. None of them knew each other before they got on that bus, and they were going to Burning Man for the first time. They were all from different parts of the UK. Look how excited they are. They come to experience this place that is the biggest playground on earth for the one week that it exists. They come to see these massive artworks. It is the largest art park, the largest outdoor museum that exists during this time. People come to create, they come to experience, they come to play. They come to be in this extreme environment to test their boundaries, to grow, to be inspired. That's my bike on the back. It says saying yes to right now. On the front, it has a lift mustache. I give people, I give strangers rides around, pick them up if they want to ride and take them somewhere. And I've been going to Burning Man for 16 years. I've been going since I was in my late teens, and it has profoundly shaped my worldview. The way that I view the world and how I see myself in it and how I see all people in it is that we are powerful creators, and we can create anything that we set our minds to. Burning Man creates a place for people to work together, build things together. It is phenomenal. So four years ago, I said, upon someone's suggestion, they said, I think that you should work for Burning Man. And even though I'd been going for 12 years, it, it had never occurred to me to work for the organization that produces this event. And not only is it an event, there's a headquarters in San Francisco with about 70 people who work year round. And what are they doing? They are helping to support people who want to spread Burning Man culture around the world. And that culture is based on generosity, participation, and creativity. So four years ago, I said, I want to work for Burning Man. What do you think happened? I ended up working for Burning Man. So for the last three years, I've been working with the organization in the communications department on the fundraising team, and I've been the lead producer for the last two years on the Burning Man Global Leadership Conference, which serves hundreds of people every spring who are interested in being leaders in their part of the world to help spread this culture. So I know a thing or two about how to build participatory culture. So this framework, created ta a taxonomy that breaks down into three categories. It's attitude, access, and agency. The first category is attitude. Attitude starts with curiosity. What is curiosity? Well, it's questions. The first question that we should start with is, what do I want? That should be followed by, what can I contribute, or what can I give, or what can I do? What can I contribute towards what I want? What can I contribute towards the world that's going to add value to it? Second part of attitude 
is inclusion. Again, starting with questions. Whenever we want to create a solution for a group of people, we need to start with the questions of, what is it that you want? What issues do you see in creating it? How can you be involved? The way that Charlotte ties into this is she said, I want to create a proposal. I want to see my skid, my, the, this school be better for my child and for all the children who go there. And then she talked to the people who are there every single day and said, what do you want to see here? And she got them involved. I'd like to tell you about a personal hero. His name is Marlon Parker. Marlon lives in Cape Town, South Africa. He lives in the Cape Town Flats where he was born and raised. Marlon, in the late 2000s, said, I want to help one person. I want to help change one person's life. And he said, what can I do? Well, Marlon is a computer science teacher at a school in Cape Town. And he found one person who was a former gang member, and he started to teach this person computer science and pretty how to use a computer. Pretty shortly thereafter, that guy said, hey, Marlon, I want you to teach my friends. And so then they had a little class. Very soon after that, they wanted to have more people teach. And what Marlon did was he empowered them to teach their friends. Pretty soon, they had classes for senior citizens. They had classes for young children. They had classes for mothers. And this project is called Our Labs. Our Labs is now in 22 countries around the world, and it has touched the lives of 5.2 million people. And what it does is it educates them, empowers them, it gives them access to tools so that they can help lift themselves out of poverty, out of violence, and out of drug use. The second part of the framework is access. So access to space is the first part of that. And when I talk about space, it's physical space. It's places where people can bump into to each other, where they can share ideas, where they can be inspired, where they can work together. And then they need access to information, tools, and training. This is exactly what Marlon did with our labs and continues to do today. Does anyone know who this is? That's my mom. <laughs> my mom's a fabulous woman, and as I like to say, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> I'm showing you my mom because my mom had a challenge. My mom was faced with a situation that many Americans are faced with right now, which is a fear of not having enough income when they retire. So my mom took matters into her own hands. My mom said, what do I want? Well, I want to have enough income. What can I do? My mom has a huge passion for vintage jewelry and costume jewelry. And so with the tools and technology that's available now, she's launching her own Etsy store. And she's connected with people all over the world who also share this passion for jewelry. And she's enrolled her friends to help her set it up. So the, the point of this is that it doesn't matter where you are in your life. Whatever it is you want to do, whatever issue you want to solve, the solutions are out there. And they will find you if you seek them. Last part, agency. So agency starts with inviting, and inviting is the most important part of this framework after you know what it is that you want. I believe that people, if left to their own devices, will seek self-actualization, and self-actualization comes through two things. It comes through growth and contribution. And so most of us, if you think about the times in your life where you've had really satisfying experiences, it's probably been when you've been giving back when you've been paying it forward, when you've been helping someone else. And so inviting, I believe that people will participate, they will get involved, oftentimes they just need an invitation. So it looks like this, would you like to, would you like to help me with this? Or I saw this cool show that's coming to town, I know you have a passion for X, Y, Z, do you, do you, maybe you're interested in this. So helping connect those dots. A few weeks ago I gave a talk and I went on stage and I started by saying, I, I have a hankering for making some art right now. Will you make some art with me? And what I did was asked everybody to take out their phones and I took a selfie of them and they all took a picture too. And they loved it, look how happy they are. And this was this little moment of joy. And I think that Christina was the happiest person in the audience. Next, we have connecting. So connecting is different than networking. With networking, networking, we seek to leverage our professional and our personal relationships so that we can develop a business pipeline for ourselves. 
connecting is different. Connecting seeks to help put people together so that they can mutually benefit. So if I see that John has a need for a certain skill set and Mary has that skill set and she is is looking she has some extra time and she's wanting to get involved with something, I'll say, hey John, meet Mary. You guys might have this in common and might like to talk about this. And then I step out of it. Now the cool thing about this is that in building the human network, in building our social ecosystem, by connecting those people, by adding value to their businesses, to their lives, I then become relevant in this ecosystem. I have a place in it, I add value to it. So this is what we're looking to do, is create this, this web around the world. And coming out of the Burning Man world, I can tell you this network is alive and well. There are so many people out there who are excited to help and build and create things together. Lastly, we have translating. Anytime you bring two groups together who have differences, any kind of differences, it can be language, it can be age, it can be gender, it could be any sort of differences, there needs to be somebody who can help facilitate communication so that those two groups can find shared interest. So this framework is about getting stuff done. Now I said I was gonna tell you about my life as a revolutionary. It is not what you are picturing. You will not see me picking up a gun anytime soon. The revolution that I am talking about is a revolution of consciousness. It's a revolution of awareness. It's a revolution of choice. It is peaceful, it is intelligent, and it is organized. It looks like me raising my hand and saying, this is important, I care about this, and I am willing to change and do something about it. Will you help me? This is the revolution that we are after. It is a revolution for evolution. In the early 1960s, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, through our scientific genius, we have made a neighborhood of the world. And now, through our moral and ethical commitments, we must make a brotherhood of it. I believe that if he were alive, he would say a brotherhood and a sisterhood. He went on to say, we must all learn to live together or we will all perish together as fools. He also said, the hour is late. The clock of destiny is ticking out. We must act now before it is too late. I am here to invite you to start creating the life that you want to live a life that is considerate of all humans, of all species, and of our planet. I am here to invite you to start asking the question, what do I want? What can I create? What can I contribute? Now, if you're saying, Rosie, that's great and all, but I have a family and I have a career and I have hardly any time to brush my teeth, I can't even fathom doing more. Well, maybe your role on this planet is to raise empathetic, resilient, caring children. Maybe that's your job on this planet. There's a role for all of us, and no role is too small, no role is too big. We all play an essential part. Tap into what it is that you want and start creating it. Thank you very much. Thank you.